taking place. Michael Rossi, Barbara Parkins as Betty Anderson, Christopher Connolly as Norman Harrington, Patricia Morrow as Rita Harrington, James Douglas as Stephen Corr, Elizabeth Walker as Carolyn Russell, Percy Rodriguez as Harry Miles, and also starring Barbara Rush as Marsha Russell. doctor's hospital. Dr. Michael Rossi and Fred Russell almost came to blows, and only the quick intervention of Norman Harrington prevented a fight. Once again, the subject of their conflict was Carolyn, Fred's daughter. And once again, Dr. Rossi had tried to stop Fred from harassing the girl, from using a blatant lie about Carolyn and Lou Miles. This is Dr. Rossi here. I'm going to be at 555-6787 five, 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 seven, seven for just uh, a couple of minutes or so. Yes, Dr. Rossi. Very sick. I said you needed medical help. Stand to feel like this. How about a drink, Doctor? It's a nice place. It's a way to start off, I suppose, a place big like this. And if you have any arguments or anything, one of you can go in here and kind of hide out for a while. The other one can stay out there, huh? Something was always funny about my home. It just seemed like the family was always stuck in one room somewhere. There was never any place to go to. Kind of lick your wounds, uh, rebuild your ego or anything. Why don't you sit down for a while? Yeah. I don't know what the hell was the matter with me, but he made me so mad I just want to take my fist and just jam it down his throat. But if you didn't... Yeah, right again, you might have been in a lot of trouble. I couldn't believe it was you. For a while, I couldn't believe it was me either. I'm shocked to sometimes look down deep inside again, see all the anger and contempt, the, the hatred has been building up inside of you. You didn't even, didn't even know it was there. I mean, ignorant stupidity. You can excuse that, you know, but when a grown man deliberately and with free meditation who just tries to use terror tactics on a child, I mean, there's no excuse for it, that's all. God knows what would have happened if I'd have hit him. I suppose I'd be in some police station somewhere trying to explain to Marsha over the phone. All right, we couldn't go off and get married tonight. We'll set up. Get married? Yeah. Didn't I tell you? You didn't tell us. Yeah. No, Dr. Rossi, you didn't tell us. What are you going to do? Well, <gasps> congratulations. You're not a bachelor anymore, going huh? off to Orange Ridge. Like we did. Yeah, the same. A little older, but the same. Well, oh, and that's the best news I've ever heard. Oh, oh, don't even listen to him. We've been hoping you'd find someone as beautiful as Mrs. Russell. Somebody really make you happy. Oh, she'll make me happy, all right. The question is whether or not she can put up with me. I've been a bachelor. Oh, long. i got to tell, tell you one thing. You're going to really have to work at it. Well, I'll work at it. I think I'm ready. Oh, it's so wonderful. Just don't let anything worry you or spoil it for you, okay? I'm gonna get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope you feel a lot better. I do. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Give the bride a kiss for it. Yeah, I will. Bye. Some other time, Susan. You and Dr. Rossi make an awful lot of noise. 
I didn't notice you. Where were you? In the hospital? Coming out? In the hospital. When you heard the two of us. I think one of us has had too much to drink. I live down the hall from you. I saw Dr. Rossi pounding on your door. Oh, that. I thought you were talking about just now. We ran into each other again outside the hospital. Really? Oh. Like the old time boxing fights, hmm? When they were illegal, two guys would have a go at it for 20 or 30 rounds, and then the cops would come and break it all up. But then, a couple of hours later, in another part of town, under a pier somewhere, they'd start all over again. Draper, may I have another one of these, please? Yes, Mr. Hustle. I'll bring it right over. I'll take it here. Yeah. Just how much did you hear? Oh, just a lot of shouting. He's on some kind of wild tear. You saw him, didn't you, Draper? Sir? Dr. Rossi. Oh, yeah, he had a pretty good head of steam. He came charging in, rushed right through here. I thought there was a bit trouble, but I figured you could handle it, Mr. Russell. I'm not so sure about that. I've seen angry people before, but a good doctor is completely insane. Well, I don't blame him. Fred, what are you hanging around town for? Not you, too. You know something, Fred? I'm disappointed in you. The lady dumped you. Dumped, as in trash can. He's not going to get away with it. I'll tell you that. He thinks he's got it all going for him. Chief of staff of a hospital. Big man on campus type of guy. Beloved by all who know him. And underneath all that, he's full of all kinds of jealousies and hates. <laughs> Haven't you got this thing turned inside out? Aren't you describing yourself? Draper, would you send this up to my room, please? Oh, come on, Fred. I'll be good. Forget it, Draper. You know, I'm beginning to remember you now. Welcome to the trash can. Hey, Charlie. Be right with you, Ray. There you are, darling. Don't spill it. Thank you. Charlie. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, thanks. 190 out of two. Thanks. Hey, Lou. Lou, come here a minute, will you? Be right with you, Sergeant. Lou, look at this mess. You got, the, got it all mixed up. You got the vibes and cans all together with the water. Oh, wow. Sorry about that, Charlie. I, I got something on my mind. You mean that thing about you and Russell in front of the hospital? I heard about that, but forget it. Just take care of business. Okay, 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 right. How you been, Sergeant? Oh, fine, Charlie, and yourself? Not bad. Coffee? You're not speaking today? Hello, Sergeant Walker? You walk right past me. I'll take the coffee now. Cream and sugar, right? I remember. I've got something to do down here. Take care of this uh, shelf. Excuse me. Lou? Lou? We can talk from here. About what? Oh, yeah. Of course you know. And that's your trade, huh? It's my job. Look, Lou, I've known you for a long time. I, I thought maybe we could talk. Get to the bottom of this whole thing. And that uniform and those three stripes, that doesn't mean a thing. Is that what you're going to tell me? Take it easy, Smith. Now, we both lived in this town long enough to know that we'd never had this kind of trouble before. You mean we'd never had it out in the open before? Jeff Kramer. We grew up together. Went all through uh, grammar school with each other. And the rest of them, uh, well, most of them, the respectable townspeople. 
They all call me the doctor's son. The black doctor's son. Hmm? No, they just stare at me like I'm some kind of freak, you know? Old Lady Crossing. Old Lady Crossing, I've never said more than hello or goodbye to her since I've known her, since I was about your high, right? Now she just stares at me. Just stares. <laughs> We've never had this happen before. I know what you mean. Go on, kid. Well, I was really ready for Carolyn's father. I mean, really ready for him. I looked him dead in the eye. And I could see that that's what he wanted. You know, he wanted me to go just a, a little too far, just a wee bit too far, you know? And then Dr. Rossi came up and it was over. Suppose Dr. Rossi hadn't come along. What'd you have in mind? I wanted to hit him. Yeah. Yeah, it was that close. New England gets 60% of all the possible sunshine. That's a filler. What's a filler? Well, just this. Something a newspaper uses to fill up a column. You know, like the average temperature is such and such and so and so place. My son, Elliot, when he was editor of the Clarion, he was an expert on fillers. He had one <laughs> bee sting, that's all. Just bee sting. My, your Elliot was a bit on the droll side, wasn't he? Well, he's chip off the old block. Yeah, that smells good. I think I'll give him a bit more seasoning. Come on, sit down, Maggie. Your tea's getting cold. I'll sit down a minute. You're fussing too much over those fish. Spent the whole day out in the water with you catching this miserable batch of perch. And we're going to eat them. We're not going to act the way people in town do. No, sir. <laughs> all right, Maggie. All right, all right. You know what people in town do? They just fish for sport. And as soon as they get back in town, they dump all the fish in the nearest mailbox. And they go home and cook themselves a frozen steak that they bought in the supermarket. Well, in the country, it's different. When you're from the country, food's food. And you learn to eat what there is. <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, Maggie, I was just thinking. Do you know that sometimes you and I act like a couple of married people? What do you mean by that? Well, I was just thinking how long it's been since my wife passed away. In many ways, you help me to remember that, how much I miss her, how much I miss having someone to share my life with. It makes a great difference. Oh. Because of late years, I've led kind of a second-hand life through my son and through my daughter-in-law. But now, Maggie, with you, I have some place to come, some place to eat, and it's wonderful. Oh. Well... Thank you, Eli. It's nice to feel appreciated. Maggie, have you ever thought about getting married again? Married? Yes. Well, I don't know. Why, Eli Carson, are you proposing to me? And supposing I am. Why, I... I don't know what to say. It's a very simple question. Well, don't you think that we're a little bit old for this sort of thing? Well, that's a strange kind of an argument. Well, what I mean is, Eli, at our age, a person gets kind of set in their ways. A person gets where he wants to do things his own way. I know how you feel, and I feel exactly the same way. I've got some terrible habits. But I'll tell you what, I'll learn to put up with your habits if you'll learn to put up with mine. That's not quite all there is to it, Eli. I haven't been free as long as you have. 
And I told you what being married to Mr. Riggs was like. Yes, you did. Well, after something like that, a person isn't very anxious to jump right back in. It, it might take me a, a little bit longer to be able to decide. Peggy, we'll forget it. I'm sorry that I brought it up. Oh, for goodness sake. People our age don't elope. Oh, they don't? No. Well, it looks like eloping to me. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Yes. Stealing away in the dead of night to some far remote place. Far remote place. Owen Ridge. Well, we are going to go to the Justice of the Peace, and it's not going to be fuss, no bother. You mean you aren't even going to allow your groom the opportunity to forget the ring? Of course not. Well, all grooms have to be able to forget something, the ring. The license, something. Well, even Dr. Rossi. You do like him, don't you? Yes, I do. Can you do hang this up for me? I know that I... I did give you a bad time when I saw that you were falling in love with him. You were being loyal to your father, dear. I think that's natural. You're not only that. I think that I was jealous. I think that I didn't want you and Dr. Rossi to feel that way about one another. But now that I know Dr. Rossi, I'm very glad that you're marrying him. Carolyn, do you know how happy it makes me to hear you say that? Oh, I'm glad you're glad. <laughs> I think that that's supposed to be blue. What, the suit? Yeah. Oh, the second time around? Mm -hmm. I think I read that someplace. And and by the fifth time, you're entitled to red spangles. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to miss that. I just want everything to be perfect. Carolyn, I think everything is going to be just fine. I know it. And I hope that you and Dr. Rossi... Carolyn, don't you think it's about time you started in calling him Mike? I hope that you and Mike will be very happy. You and Mike and me. We want you to be happy too, my darling. I will. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. I'm like you. We don't fall apart easily, do we? Nope. Now. Now, would you hang this up for me, dear? Yeah. And I'll put this away. Can I do anything more? No. I'm just going to put this over here. Now, are you ready? Yeah. I've packed all my new records. And Pat says that she has all of her new records waiting for me. <laughs> then let's go. <laughs> anything except Mike and the wedding. And so you mustn't think about me because I really want you to be very happy. I know you do. I know that. I would appreciate it if you would get straight to the point. I just came from Mr. Cord's office, but he didn't send me. And the fact that he knew I was here and why, I don't think he'd be very pleased. 
I don't blame you for being suspicious, Mrs. Arrington. Under the circumstances, I would be. But I think someone should be honest with you. You see, we're both being used by Mr. Court. Look, I made it very clear to him I want no part of any court fight. No legal maneuverings that would break Mr. Payton's last will. Maybe that's what he wants to hear. He's a very clever man, you know. Get to the point, Jennifer. All right. I intend to get my share. I want to make a deal with you. What do you mean, make a deal with me? Mr. Cord's going after his grandfather's money. One way or another. No matter what it takes or how long, he'll get it. With or without you. Look, I am very busy and I don't want to have to listen to you. I any... don't believe you. It's a big estate. Much too big for me or you or anyone to say they're not interested. I'm not a fraud. I'm a valuable witness. I only told half a story. I can tell things in court about Mr. Payton that, well, no man in his right mind would have said them or done them. There's no point in telling me any of this. I think there is. When I came to Mr. Cord, I knew the value of what I had to offer. And I wanted something in return. But your ex-husband's playing games with me. The ethical attorney who can't make a deal with his witness. Well, he can't win his case without me. But he can win with me. So could you, Mrs. Harrington. But I must warn you, he may try to dump you. He may try to break both with. Then that would leave him as the natural heir. But he can't do it without me. He can't dump me. That's why, before you really make up your mind, you'd better consider making a deal, because then you'd be sure of me. I don't need to make any deals, and I don't need Mr. Payton's money. All right. I have listened to what you have to say, and now I want you to leave. That's too bad. He said you were a fighter. That's what he liked about you. You mean he? Mr. Payton, he'd be very disappointed. But don't you understand what that second will was? It was a piece of paper that voided the first will that left me out entirely. Now, all that money goes to charity. He was old, and he was dying, and he listened to people. Someone wanted to make sure that you didn't get his money. Someone? Like I said, there wasn't time to tell it all. If I were you, I'd use him. I'd let Mr. Stephen Cord work for me, on my terms. That's why if we made an agreement, we'd be sure of each other. Good night, Jennifer. I hope when you make up your mind, you'll uh, get in touch with me. Coached you, told you what to say. Well, not exactly. Why? Well, you see what happened. You didn't have any contact with Mr. Payton at all. You're just making a fool of yourself. We've had a lot of good years together, baby. Please, let me go! 